Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of the Surge Podcast. So, um, I've gotten a couple of requests to start talking about sort of um, an introduction to intubation and ventilators, maybe for for uh, people who don't do this regularly, and, and maybe asked to do it uh, in, in in the current situation that we're in worldwide, the Corona situation, and you know. I, I, I promised that I'd do something like this if enough people requested it and, you know, enough people made themselves heard. So this is going to be a bit of an extended episode. And the idea is to just sit down uh, during your curfew or whatever, or social isolation situation, wherever you are, and maybe try and absorb some of it. And the idea here is to sort of transition you from, I, I'm a firm believer in martial arts training and the structure of martial arts training. So from, you're not going to go from a white belt to a black belt tomorrow morning. And there are certain things that you can teach, and there are certain things that you're going to have to figure out on your own in, in any martial art. And I think that the same is true for acute care medicine. Um, the reason why we have some trials that are very limited and some trials that have give us very clear answers is because some aspects of our discipline are things that you just have to figure out on your own. Yes, there are translatability issues, consistency issues, etc., study design problems, ethics, but in general, as, as a philosophical concept, there are certain things that we have to figure out on our own, and then there are certain things that we need to be taught. When you reach a point where you're beginning to develop a competence and you're starting to figure things out on your own, that's called a blue belt in many martial arts. And that's where I'm hoping to take you in this journey. It's not necessarily to make you a champion intubator. I can't do that. Uh, difficult airway courses run between $1,500 and $5,000, right? And, you know, this is free. So you get what you pay for. But that was a joke. But um, my hope is to transition you from being completely scared about of intubating and not knowing the difference between the different structures or what drugs to get, etc., or when to wear the mask, all this stuff, whether or not you even need a mask, up to a point where you understand the discipline itself, you understand that aspect of, of your training or, or of your job, and when you do it, you have some comfort in what you're doing, and you, you can expect what's going to happen, right? So this is part of a crash course that um, I give locally here in Kuwait, and the point of the crash course is to turn you into a very capable um ventilator and airway uh, person who can uh, take on the role of an RT, uh, possibly even a very good uh, R3 in anesthesia up to that point. I scale it up to that level, and it depends on the institution and what they'd like. If you'd like me to give these courses remotely in a more interactive session or something very similar to it, please feel free to contact me. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, uh, I could not have set this stuff up without the um, help and support of the uh, Kuwait Association of Surgeons. Uh, it was their idea in the beginning, and a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about over the next couple of days is actually based on, on, on the material that I gave there. Um, in terms of the data out there for uh, intubations and indications for intubations, so a lot of it comes from uh, unaccepted proofs, pre-publication data, because we're still at that stage, even one month in, right? We still don't have a very good peer review process. Um, that's a topic for another day. I think that our peer review process in medicine is a bit flawed. Let's leave it at that. And I'm also going to look at the clinical predictors of mortality that form the basis for decisions to admit patients to the ICU in the initial Wuhan outbreak. And that's actually been accepted for publication now. It's no longer considered a letter to the editor. It's actually been, been accepted as a retrospective cohort study. And then there's the expert recommendations from Ground Zero. Right from from the guys who've done this, and, and they formed their own task force, which is the right thing to do. And you know, you, you can clearly tell that there's a very strong anesthesia emphasis here, which means that these guys are expert intubators when they're making these decisions, right? And they're not one single center, a group consensus type of situation, but they're people from, you know, the geriatrics programs uh, from. The uh, from Peking, which is you know relatively big capital from Guangzhou, which is a fantastic center, uh, Fudan University in Shanghai, um, which is uh, sort of the main hub where they worked on guidelines for 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 and the handbook 
for the coronavirus. A lot of the authors came from there and from uh, Zhangzhou University as well in the Henan province. And these are all centers that we're seeing like 500 plus cases, okay, with, with a very rapid turnaround time. So they, they kind of know what they're talking about here uh, to an extent, and I, I would take what they say with, with some urgency. So one of the first statements that they made was the QSOFA, the new score, SOFA, our, our current methodology in deciding whether or not to admit somebody to the ICU is strictly flawed for these patients because they don't have a slow decline. They don't have a, a... I think that that's why field triage systems don't work with this because field triage systems expect you to be uh, as severe as you're going to be at the time that you present in the emergency room. And that doesn't happen with, with COVID-19 or novel corona infections. Uh, what tends to happen, based on what I've seen, what I've heard, and a little bit of what I believe, I, I guess, is you have a patient that comes in and doesn't respond to therapy and then suddenly deteriorates. And there's other data towards that. And looking at the mortality data, only 25% of patients made it to the ICU before they died in China, which means that, that we had a sub optimal prediction model or suboptimal decision making model uh, so things like looking for uh, direct signs of shock acute kidney injury news or QSOFA has not been proven to be reliable and so their independent predictors or their more likely culprits have been uh, age above 60 comorbidities a lack of improvement over 72 hours uh, high CRP or lymphopenia and any evidence of shock. This included capillary refill and urine output. And I think that the Society of Critical Care guidelines point to that as well. Uh, I've got a request to summarize the guidelines in a talk too. Uh, this is dedicated for, for the actual podcast. I'll probably do that in about two to three weeks maybe, potentially earlier if you guys want to. But you know, things like capillary refill count for more than QSOFA in this particular disease pathology. I would thoroughly encourage you to like watch a couple of sessions from smack uh, like there's no like i think that there's no better conference for this type of situation and in fact i think that if if any of the organizers are listening we should probably do a totally online smack dedicated to the coronavirus where like every person who's involved gives their insights on, on what they think is important, right? And I think that, that that should be like a thing right now. But I would thoroughly tell you to listen to um, or, or watch uh, Smack Media Evokes Your License to Kill because that's one of the first principles that, you know, intubation like any surgical procedure, any procedure of note, has its own risks and benefits and should be addressed as such. And what seems to be the indications for intubation are a increased respiratory effort uh, to an overwhelming extent, increased work of breathing. So these are all subjective scores that are in the old ICU book. So I'm talking like Jan Tobin, the old school ARDS book uh, that we all read. Um, you know, that type of thing where, where you're like you're assessing work of breathing based on accessory muscle use, increased tachypnea, etc. Uh, FiO2 requirements more than high flow nasal cannula with no improvement over two hours. So at some point, the patient's work of breathing should improve once you've started high flow nasal cannula. Some institutions are veering away from it. I don't think that it's that big a droplet risk compared to BiPAP. I think that BiPAP should be thrown in the garbage for these patients, but high flow nasal cannula should be in. That's just an opinion. That's not evidence-based. Um, but you know, if they're not improving over two hours, you should consider possibly intubating them because they're not going to improve. And if you have a complete lack of improvement for 72 hours, typically patients turn a corner after IV fluid, hydration, etc., and careful monitoring and nutrition within 72 hours. And that's all over the Wuhan data and is starting to show up in other data fonts as well. You have to understand that this is a list of things from a cohort. So I can't give you a true propensity risk analysis that, you know, we usually do for things like trauma, okay? We don't have that resolution of data yet. Other intubation indications are warning signs. So what's been clear from all the papers, even the early ones, is that if you wait or try and buy time to intubate because you're trying to save a ventilator, your patient's going to do worse. And anybody who's been a good clinical triage officer, I think, in my humble opinion, having done that job, should make it clear to his crew that his job is to worry about everybody else in the room. Uh, 
Their job is to worry about their patients and their patients only. So it shouldn't be the crew member, the junior member, making the decision not to intubate. Right? An aggressive approach to intubation should be the gold standard that we adhere to here. Intubation saves lives in coronavirus, despite the risks associated with ventilation in general. No BiPAP. Unless you have a shortage of ventilators, no BiPAP. And if you're thinking about doing it, call for help first. Have a second person around just in case you need it. When you're approaching airway management, uh, ask yourself, is intubation indicated? Is this going to be a crash airway situation? Is there a potential for a difficult airway? Is RSI appropriate? And am I dealing with a failed airway? What's my adjunct going to be? What's my, my bailout, my parachute, right? So whenever you're dealing with vanilla, quote-unquote, intubations, we usually have a question of uh, should we intubate awake or asleep, oral or nasal intubation uh, to paralyze patients or not. And that I would contend you don't need to worry about for now. Okay, that I would contend is is not something that you should worry about. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's because that's these are the type of discussions that we don't need to have because we've already had them in the literature. And your patient population is an acute patient population, and the answers are there. The gold standard for us is RSI. Uh, this is from Life in a Fast Lane. Uh, I take no credit for uh, something this organized in an illustration. I'm not that smart. Um, so this is what RSI looks like. Uh, for those of you who don't know what RSI is, it's a multi-stage uh, procedure that is uh, characterized or its signature is uh, giving both the paralytic agent and induction agent in unison. So when you start treatment, it starts 10 minutes before you're treating the patient. So once you're thinking about intubating, give yourself a good five minutes to set up the equipment that you need. This includes an ambu bag, pre-oxygenating, the patient should start five minutes beforehand, using that ambu bag, allowing them to breathe on their own. Give any pre-treatment that you might wanna give, such as a bolus, maybe start some neosinephrine if you need it, some atropine. And then at time zero, give the paralysis an induction agent, then position your patient. So I've seen this a lot, especially in the ED, where we try and position the patient before we give the paralysis agent. These patients are extremely uncomfortable. You're not going to be able to position them until you paralyze them and until you give them an induction agent. Take it from me. And then once you've positioned them, take a look, put the tube in. And we'll go through that process in a second and then confirm adequate tube placement. From the preparation stage, until you're sure that the tube is in, you should keep yourself in the same set of personal protective equipment. Once you're done with the aerosolized procedure, preferably in a negative pressure isolation room, if you can get it, then exchange your clothing and exchange your PPE device, uh, your PPE equipment. Now, the issue is that you're going to get some people, especially people who haven't done intubation in a long time, that are going to tell you that RSI is only good if you're dead or if you really need it. That's prehistoric. That's like Flintstones level evidence. Okay, uh, we now know that RSI is the gold standard in any acute situation. And then you're going to get people to tell you that it's only good if the patient has a full stomach and this patient's been MPO just in case we needed to intubate them and you could have etc. etc. delayed sequence. The answer is no. So RSI is the gold standard. RSI saves lives. RSI works. Okay. And you know, in, in an era like we have now, postmodern era, we have so many different techniques that RSI not only can work, but even if it doesn't work, we have excellent, excellent backup plans. And I would say that the only time that you should intubate awake or intubate without any induction agents at all is if you have a crashing patient with a systolic below 60, because at that point, they're not perfusing their brain. They're not feeling anything. Neuromuscular blockade in the right hands improves intubation skills. You are almost night and day different. Right, it's kind of like if you're a surgeon listening to this, it's like me telling you uh, to perform a right hemicolectomy uh, while the patient's coughing on table, uh, while on sevo pure, without any muscle relaxant. All right, and I'm telling you to do it under laparoscopy with the patient bucking around. It's almost impossible to do, right? So, what do you expect your anesthetist to have an or or intensivist or the person intubating? to have an extreme comfort at intubating without neuromuscular blockade. It stands to reason that if you block the patient and if the patient's paralyzed, you're more likely to get the tube in. 
The advantages, like we talked about, are that it's less traumatic, it's a quicker way in, has a higher success rate, certainly, and has minimal hemodynamic effects in terms of rebound hypertension, hypotension, etc. The disadvantages are that it's it's a burn bridge, all right? You're going to have to get the airway in somehow. There is no data that says that it increases surgical airway rate, but there's always that one person at every m M&M that I've been in in which I've done a surgical airway for somebody that tells me it could have been preventable. Prove it. We have the Danish anesthesia database. Prove it to me, okay? When you're selecting the sedative agents, and if you want, I can go into greater detail here in the next episode or the episode after that, I tend to have primary concerns and secondary concerns. So primary concerns are the things that I'm worried about. If I'm worried about hemodynamics, my go-to choice is ketamine or fentanyl or etomidate in that order. Yes, I've listed fentanyl first. I'm not sure why I did it. I would prefer ketamine. If I'm looking at neuroprotection, propofol or thiopental because they stop seizures. Bronchodilation, definitely ketamine. In terms of speed, propofol or ketamine, for sure, right? And then I look at my secondary concerns. If I'm worried about a person's hemodynamics, thiopental and propofol are more likely to cause tachyarrhythmias, etc. Ketamine has a theoretical risk of raising the ICP. I don't believe it myself. If I need to intubate them quickly, do not use midazolam. So I don't know. I see a lot of people using midazolam these days. I think it's because of the um, colloquial fear of, of fentanyl. And if I've given naloxone for whatever reason, I wouldn't use fentanyl because it's not going to have an effect if the naloxone is still circulating. Okay. And then there are specific contraindications such as porphyria, avoid the drug in question. Now, I keep getting asked about adjunct maneuvers like a burp. A burp is a selic maneuver. A selic maneuver is cricoid pressure. Yes, there are differences between the three, but you are a white belt transitioning to becoming a blue belt, and in your eyes, they're all the same thing. Don't do it before the patient is, is down, right? Make sure that the patient's fully sedated and paralyzed, if, if you like paralysis, and compress the airway accordingly. And don't do it if the person can't get a view. Allow them to control the larynx for you until they can get a view, and then apply the car code pressure. And do not let go until the ET tube uh, balloon is inflated, okay? Release if you have active vomiting from the start of it because you're not doing well enough and all you're doing is you're increasing the back pressure on the stomach. Post-intubation uh, hypotension. So treat it with a bolus, treat it with neosinephrine, but then look for other things. It's not just sympathetic drive that could be a problem. You could have an MI, so look at the cardiac waveform. You could have a tension pneumothorax, so look for that. You could have autopy being generated, especially because, like I'll go through ventilation for COVID-19 patients in a separate talk, but I really do think that, you know, they're different. Let's leave it at that for now, but look for autopy. Now, the Difficult Airway Society, I don't like reinventing the wheel, as many of you know, has come up with recommendations uh, for difficult intubations. These include a supraglottic airway and the possibility of a surgical airway if you really need it. I would say that your first failsafe should be a supraglottic airway as a, a transition towards a, a, a definitive airway. If it has to be a surgical airway, then so be it. The best place to watch surgical airways, in my humble opinion, is mcrit.org's cricothyroidotomy scalpel finger bougie technique video. It is awesome. It is by far the best video to describe it ever. Like, you couldn't have made a better video, right? So I would watch it. I think everybody should. It should be, like, mandatory in all schools, man. In terms of other devices and maneuvers, so first maneuver that will save a life is a jaw thrust and chin lift. Okay, recognize this. Putting in a Gadella airway in a one awake patient is not a good idea. Putting it in a patient who you think is down because they're sedated or hypoxemic will tell you if they're awake or not. So it's a good litmus test. And if you can ventilate through a Gadel airway, that means that your only obstruction is probably the tongue. Now, this is not evidence-based. This is brouhaha, but it's probably the tongue. With your choice of intubating devices, you know, there's always a dilemma, right? So direct laryngoscopy has been the most studied. With a bougie, you have the best chances of success. However, there is that one paper that came out of I don't know where that every anesthetist quotes, and I'm not picking on anesthetists. I'm just saying that they quote it that tells you that uh, you're not as good as they are unless you've done 100 intubations. So I don't know, grain of salt there. But that's that's one concern that I have. And also you have a high risk of splash. This is particular to COVID-19 positive patients or query COVID patients. Video laryngoscopy is my favorite. 
It's been my favorite for training people because I can watch with them. And because I do a little bit of laparoscopy, I'm fairly comfortable looking at the screen while intubating. And I think that it's it's also pretty good because you're not going to get splashed, right, when you're intubating. And that's another good reason to have it. It's because when you when you put the laryngoscope in or the video laryngoscope in, you can be at a fair distance and, and your risk of aerosol transmission is almost not there. It's pretty bad for people who aren't paralyzed, though. And you need to re-clean the device or you might risk cross-infection. So you need to have a good cleaning process for the device and a cleaning person available. Fiber optic bronchoscopy, given the amount of secretions, may not be a good idea, but it could be useful because you can get a bronchoalveolar lavage, so it's both diagnostic and therapeutic, theoretically, especially now that there's some data on multifocal versus unifocal COVID positivity, and its uh, clinical significance is not there yet, but could be in the future. The only thing that I would caution you about fiber optic bronchoscopy is the lens might get a little bit contaminated, and if you get one drop on that lens, that's it, you've lost your visuals. McCoy is a bit of a sort of purple belt to brown belt level thing. I'll do a whole talk on how to use a McCoy in a sec, like in a couple of weeks. So this is what a, a um, inflamed upper airway looks like when you have an upper respiratory infection. Uh, you can tell, like, it, it's always usually inflamed. Some of it is because of the chronic coughing. The adenoids are all up in there. The tongue is pretty big. And there you go, you're visualizing right now. And that's not quite the view that you want, but it's good enough. And then there you go, that's the view, right? But be, recognize that the view is not the only thing that makes it easy. So now I'm trapped because of the edema across the airway and the vocal cords, right? And uh, the reason why I'm showing you such a quote-unquote bad video, and I'm not using a stilet for other reasons, but the reason why I'm showing you such a bad video is because I want you to see uh, how things look when you're dealing with an inflamed airway that, uh, in theory at least, could be a COVID patient's airway, right? Um, yes, I took consent for this. The patient's doing fine. Uh, don't be too worried. Now, I always get this question and this frustration, especially when they're practicing on, on a Lyrdal dummy, uh, intubating. People always look confused when they're putting the laryngoscope in. So the first thing I do is I show them what a St. Mark's retractor looks like. So if you're a surgical resident, you have nightmares about the St. Mark's retractor. But the St. Mark, Mark's retractor only works if you're in the correct plane, in the correct position, with the correct amount of tension across the pubic symphysis, that bone. And I would contend that a laryngoscope is basically just a retractor just like the St. Mark's retractor. If you think of it as a retractor, and you go back in your head, back to that first day you were on your surgical rotation, either as a student or as a resident or as a student nurse, etc., and you got asked to hold that retractor for four hours, you know what you're doing. You're halfway there, man. So for a retractor to work, first the position has to be correct. And the position has to align your airway in a manner that gets you a parallel view. The second aspect that has to be there is, you have to be able to produce the lift. Now, the lift comes from being in the correct plane between the epiglottis and the tongue. That plane is called the villicula. And you have to be able to raise the actual tip of the laryngoscope against the hyoid bone on the villicula. And that's how you get that view. That's how you get view number one or A. If you're just proximal, you're going to get B. If you're not actually at the villicula. C is when you're you're over the tongue, but you're way too far. You're about a centimeter too low on there. And then D is when you're still resting on the tongue. Okay? And obviously, uh, these are Malampati scores. Um, you know, you're only going from white belt to blue belt in intubation. You're not going from white belt to blue belt in anesthesia. But that's Malampati 1, 2, 3, and uh, 4. Um, the perfect view is down below. It's a cartoon, I agree with you, but I just showed you a video, and so you should be fine and aware. Whenever you're applying cricoid burp or selic maneuver type of pressure, pressure, you press down and to the right. The idea is to target the esophagus and to align the airway in the lateral sense. Your failsafe can be a bougie. You can even produce apneic respirations through or apneic oxygenation through the bougie. Recognize it and practice on it. Your, your other fail-safes are an LMA, 
by far, LMAs and bougies have made uh, failures of intubations so much less stressful for me. Just shoving an LMA in and then addressing the concern makes my life infinitely easier. I don't really use the combi vent tubes, um, the laryngeal tube airways, but other people do. I, I don't have... I have a comfort with them, but I don't have a confidence in them. And I have no reason for it. I'm going to be honest here. Finally, the only way that you're going to transition from white belt to blue belt is to do drills and to practice. It's the same with everything else. Trust me, it's the same with any martial art. Um, drilling, drilling, drilling is the only way of getting it right. Okay? And if this isn't a martial art, if this isn't an art form in which you have to rise to an occasion and beat a challenge, then I don't know what is, especially with the pandemic that's happening right now. Acute care is the martial art of medicine. Recognize this. And so for you to be prepared, you have to plan, you have to think tactically, but you also have to drill. And you have to simulate this with personal protective equipment and with your team. And then, if you get a chance, and if your anesthetist is willing, practice uh, intubating in the operating room on elective cases. I know that we're canceling a lot of elective cases, but practice whenever you can. And do it before you need it. Don't do it on the first day that you're called into service, right? Uh, I can't say better than Hippocrates did. I would especially commend the physician who, in acute disease by which the bulk of mankind are cut off, conducts the treatment better than others. And that's our job. If you're listening to this, you're either an anesthetist, a surgeon, an intensivist, or an emergency physician, and you're so used to dealing with the shit storm that is our practice. And yes, I mean you trauma surgeons as well. RTs, people who work in the trauma bay, people who work in the ICU. We're so used to this that we're going to have to be like Hippocrates. We're going to have to commend people and train them towards this goal. Feel free to use this presentation wherever you want and listen to it later. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, my name is Saud, and I hope that this has been helpful. And please subscribe and let me know your thoughts.